Thank you everybody. Hi, my name is Shervin and I'm from UC Berkeley and today I'm going to be talking about the modeling and perception of deformable one-dimensional objects uh, such as surgical suture. Um, so what are we interested in? Ultimately what we're trying to do is uh, have reliable suture manipulation and in particular we're interested in the application of autonomous knot ties. And in the past people have approached this problem uh, from two specific approaches. Uh, first, a learning from demonstration approach where the motions of the robotic end effectors are learned from multiple demonstrations. And in this case, what you're subject to is the specific initial conditions of the demonstrations, uh, including the pickup point, the materials, and things like that. And secondly, uh, motion planning and topological state where you actually attempt to plan the topological state of the knot that you're trying to tie. Um, in this case, they sidestep the problem of modeling high energy states, such as loops, which are essential for knot ties. Um, and they did so with, by allowing fixtures in the environment. <coughs> So really what these works are missing in order for reliable manipulation is first of all an understanding of how the suture behaves in the system, um, a system for perception and ultimately feedback and motion planning. So in order to approach these what we're going to do is first we're going to build up a model for reliable manipulation of suture. Um, these are the types of behaviors that we'd like to capture, bending, twisting and the interaction between the two. And previously uh, people have actually built models and I apply these to motion planning in basic forms. And we're actually going to focus on the Bergeau et al. model and build our model on top of that. And secondly, we're going to build a system for perception. And in the past, people have approached this problem by attempting to find the end points as well as the topological state of the knot. But we're actually going to try to recover the full 3D configuration of the system. <coughs> uh, so now I'm going to present the model. Uh, our model is based off of the potential energy of the system. It's broken down into three components. One, which is the gravitational potential energy. Two, which is the bending energy, which corresponds to the amount of curvature in the configuration. And lastly, the twisting energy, which is the amount of twisting applied along the length of the object. And we're going to make the quasi-static assumption that given a specific set of end constraints, we're always going to go to the minimum potential energy. So the way our model works is we set up a, a specific number of links linked together with some end constraints. And first, you have the gravity, which just corresponds to the height of each of the vertices. There is an energy associated with bending, which is the angle between consecutive vertices. Uh, and a twisting, which goes across the object. And what we're going to actually do is we're going to assign a frame such that the first axis is aligned with the next link. And the other axes correspond to the actual material. And what we're going to do in order to find the actual twist angle is we're going to propagate a frame, a reference frame along, and we're going to apply the minimum amount of rotation in order to al align it with the next link at the vertice. And then there's going to be an angle left over between the material and this reference frame. And that angle is how we're going to represent our twist. And we're going to propagate this frame throughout the entire object in order to find a twist angle <coughs> that corresponds to the actual material that's being twisted. And once you have a model like this in place, you can get interesting behavior by simply manipulating the end positions of the object and applying a rotation. And this is the sort of behavior you might see. So as I mentioned in the model, it's broken down into three components. But there's these three free parameters which correspond to how these three parts of the potential energy are weighted relative to each other. And one thing we wondered is whether it matters whether this actually affects the types of configurations that you see. And indeed, we found that uh, it does. Sorry about that. Um, so here what you see is three different configurations that have the same exact end constraints and the same lengths. All we did is we varied the parameters of our model and we found the minimum energy configuration. As you can see, the behavior is drastically different, even though we initialized from exactly the same point. Um, so one thing we wondered is, do these actual parameters correspond to different materials that you might find in suture? Uh, and we set out to discover whether this was true. Um, so what we tried to do is we tried to actually learn the different parameters of the model. So first, we took a set of images uh, from labeled data. Then we hand labeled them in order to find the 3D configuration of the object. And then we picked a set of parameters in order to try. And what we wanted to see is whether the minimum energy configuration with this set of parameters was going to correspond to the data that we saw in real life. Uh, so what we did is we fixed those parameters, ran our simulation, and found an error which corresponds to how far you moved away from the configuration that you saw. And we plotted this error. 
And we can repeat this for different parameters. Again, changing the parameters, running the simulation, seeing how far we end up. And we can do this over and over until we end up um, with a mapping between parameters and errors. And what we define as the best parameters for that specific material is the lowest of those errors. Um, so with three types of material, we, we ran this parameter learning. And here, what you can see is the, uh, the, the test set for the three different types of materials, and indeed we found that the best scores corresponded to the same training and test set, uh, suggesting that it is indeed useful to learn the parameters for specific materials. However, the way that I set this up, you might actually end up with what we'll call sticky parameters, where you simply just don't move in your energy minimization. Maybe they're not actually representing physical reality. Uh, so what we tried to address instead is we took the same labeled data, but in addition we applied a specific set of motions to the physical objects and also labeled this data. Um, so now what we have is uh, two configurations such that all we did is we changed the end uh, constraints and we found where it ended up. And we're going to do the same thing where we fix parameters, but in this case, instead of just running the minimization, we're going to slowly apply the motions at the ends as well as the minimization. And we'll define the error as the difference between where you ended up and where you gathered the data. And just as before, you can find a mapping between errors and uh, parameters. And again, you can take the minimum of that, and that'll correspond to your best set of parameters. Um, so here's the same comparison. Um, we find that learning the parameters does reasonably well, you know, suggesting still that you can improve performance by doing this sort of parameter learning. Um, and one last question we had about this was, well, now that we've done these two types of learning, is there any difference between the two? And can we trust one more than the other? Um, so the static corresponds to simply running the energy minimization. The dynamic is what we'll define as moving the actual end constraints. So what we found is that though the diagonal is still the best, the static parameters did very poorly on the dynamic set when you actually applied the motions, but the dynamic parameters did uh, reasonably well on the static set. So we actually believe that the dynamic parameters are a little more reliable, and uh, that's the way to go. Uh, OK, so so far I've blasted through how you can do modeling and do some parameter learning for different types of objects. Um, so now I'm going to tie that into perception and how we can do things such as alleviate the problem. Um, so perception of suture ends up being difficult, one, because suture is very thin and it's easily occluded, and two, because there's no salient features, so it's really difficult to do stereo correspondence. Um, so what we did is we added our model into the system in order to alleviate these problems. So in addition to a visual reprojection error, uh, we're also going to add the actual energy associated with the model I just described. Um, so first, it, in order to run our procedure uh, where we try to minimize this, what we're going to do is we're going to first run a low-level edge detector in order to get the uh, position of the suture. Um, and for the reprojection error, we're actually going to take a 3D configuration, a 3D link, and project it onto each of our images. And we're going to define, uh, for, and then we're going to sample across that link, and, and then we're going to define the error for that link as the distance between those points and the closest detected pixels from our edge detector. And we can optimize over this in order to come up with the best edge for that uh, specific link for that specific portion. Um, and you might wonder, well, why is the model useful? Why can't you just simply reproject this over and over again until you simply match the positions? And really, the, the cases where it tends to be useful is positions like this at crossings, where it's difficult to see exactly where you go, especially very locally when you're projecting these small links onto the image. But having the model in place allows you to continue along uh, the better set um, in order to find the, the correct mapping. Uh, and again, here's an example of, this is actually the algorithm we ran here. We actually turned the model off, and the suture ended up going back on itself. This, this in all of our images, reprojected well. And here, when you had the model in place, we actually found the correct hypothesis uh, from those possible. Um, so as I described, this, you simply add these links one by one, and you build up the suture. And you can build it up. And here's your 3D configuration that you get out link by link at the end. Uh, so what we did is we gathered 180 pieces of data that we also ran our parameter learning on. And out of all 180, we were successfully able to detect the, the configuration of the suture very reliably, actually very, very close to our hand-labeled data that we, we got. Uh, lastly, what I described before 
is a method to find the configuration. But when I was describing the model, I was telling you guys that there's a twist actually involved as well. And one thing that we wanted to do in order to put this into a motion planning scheme is recover that actual twist angle. So instead, here what we're going to do is we're going to see what configuration corresponds to it being at a minimum energy. Uh, so we assign a twist angle to the actual vertex positions that we detected from our previous scheme, and we're going to run the energy minimization. And we're going to define the error as how far away you moved from the detected configuration. Um, and we're also going to use multiple observations in order to better that. Um, so what you see here is uh, for each number of observation, how much the average error in degrees was. And here is um, within what range you ended up by the end. Um, it tends to be that there's you know, certain bad cases that, that throw it off a lot. So sometimes it's more useful to see the other thing. Uh, so uh, for, to conclude, uh, we talked about how we can model suture such that we can match uh, reality reliably and how we can also apply this to perception. Uh, currently, we're extending this work to handle occlusions in the case of vision and also for motion planning. Thank you, Fermin. Thank you.